Anyway, we're delighted today uh, to have our guests. I've told you a bit about before. Uh, Kevin Jackowski. Am I saying right? Yeah, good yeah, morning, guys. Thanks for having friend, me. Yeah, who is among a number of other things, and we'll hear some as the class goes on. Uh, the author of Eight uh, Bit Christmas, and this is in the library. It's absolutely hilarious. Uh, his blurb on the top. Uh, James Fray, the author, said hysterically funny, full of heart. It's a Christmas story for the Nintendo generation. There's, if you're still looking for that present for your father, who probably <laughs> yes. is in that generation, this yeah. is the one you got. Uh, Kevin is also the screenwriter uh, for a hilarious movie, Assassination of High School President, and has written for Comedy Central and for others. And was showrunner, I think, on what's your name, Duty? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for Nickelodeon. Really kind of get all this. You know, the first time I became aware of it was Assassination of High School uh, President, which was a Sundance selection. Such a funny movie. Can you talk a little bit about that, how that came about, and what it was? Sure. Um, yeah, that was about 10 years ago, um, and it was uh, the first uh, sort of movie that uh, I, I'd sold a couple other scripts before that. That was the first one that got produced. Um, it's about a high school newspaper reporter who has never finished an article, but he thinks he's this great reporter, and he kind of uncovers this mystery. And it's, it was loosely inspired and based on Fenwick. Um, so, like, the mascot is the fry. Or, um, it's, it's black and white. There's the, yep, all that stuff. You can see the Dominican shield in places. And, um, but uh, the idea was that, and I'm not sure what you guys have studied here, but are you familiar with film noir? Have you ever heard that We're term? We're getting that yeah. semester. So it's sort of like black and white mystery, uh, that sort of idea imposed in sort of a high school environment. Um, have any of you guys seen The Big Lebowski? Yeah, okay, one. All right. So it's like that, but set in high school. Uh, so it's sort of a amalgamation of, of different genres, but uh, but a comedy at its heart. We we have a really high tech operation here, so we're all queued up actually to see a little bit of a clip. Oh wow! Uh, on this. That. Uh, Kevin, can you, first the film is hysterical. It's really really worth your view. Can you take me all the way back? Because uh, several of these folks are real interested in kind of the process and what what went on. You're sitting down. You have an idea. You didn't have a job to write this. Well, what happens? Uh, well, I was uh, I was a production assistant. My first job, well, second job in LA, uh, I was a production assistant at South Park, the TV show South Park. So I did that for a couple of years. And while I was doing that, I was uh, just writing screenplays at the same time. And I was working with uh, my buddy at the time, who was also working there. Uh, we partnered up on a bunch of stuff, and that was something that we wrote together. So we wrote one script together right before this called Your Ex Girlfriend's Cat, which was this ridiculous comedy, uh, sort of the Ghostbusters version of the dating, a romantic comedy, but this weird twist anyway. Uh, so we wrote that, we got a lot of meetings out of that, and I met with a lot of studios and producers, but it was, nothing quite happened. And then we wrote Assassination of High School President, uh, um, and that sort of got really big, and it, it uh, was named to something called The Blacklist, uh, which is a a list of the most liked uh, screenplays of the year that haven't gotten made yet. Um, it, it became sort of this really cool list that now, like, every year, uh, the best picture screenplay or the, the screenplay that wins best screenplay at the Oscars is almost always from that list. So that got us a lot of meetings, and meanwhile, you know, we're, I have to get Trey Parker's laundry, and, uh, you know, we do things like that. So. But that's sold, and, and uh, so let me take you back. To, got a lot of meetings. Yeah. How, how do you get a lot of meetings? I don't know. It's sort of this catch twenty two. You can't get uh, unless you have representation from an agent. It's really hard to meet with producers, and it's really hard to get an agent unless you already have meetings with producers. So it's it's really tricky. I was fortunate <coughs> enough. Um, I wrote uh, a screenplay when I was in grad school that ended up getting me an agent fairly quickly in, in Los Angeles. So once I had an agent, um, and that was through a friend, a friend of mine from grad school was an assistant at that agency. And so mm -hmm. she read the script and really liked it and passed it on to her boss, who then became my, my first agent, uh, so to speak. And, and then I moved out to LA. And so once you have some uh, representation, you write stuff and then that agent or manager contacts people, producers, or development executives, or studios, or sometimes actors, um, and, 
they read it, and either they like it or they don't, and if they do like it, then you can maybe meet with them, and they will either say, this is great, we want to make it, which never happens, yeah. or they say, this is really good, what else you got, you know, or this is really good, do you have uh, any books you really like you want to turn into movies, or here's an article I read, what do you think, do you think this could be a movie, uh, and so you just get meetings that way, and then people start to either like you as a person from those mm -hmm. meetings or decide they don't how, want to work with you. How did this one click? Was it a producer? Who this, um, this, and again, we were writing these on what's called spec, mm -hmm. which means no one's paying us to write. Mm -hmm. We're just doing exactly what we want to write and for, <coughs> for free, essentially. For free, yeah. not essentially, for yeah. free. And then um, uh, our agent would, would uh, you know, pass them around. Mm -hmm. And just sort of word of mouth. It's kind of yeah. like like movies, you know, like when a movie's out and people start talking about it, it's the same thing. So if studios start talking about it and, and enjoy the script, then, then um, they start to... This ended up with some pretty significant stars. Yeah, it did. Um, uh, basically, we had, it went to Vertigo Entertainment. There were two production companies. One was the Yari Film Group, which no longer exists, and the other one is Vertigo Entertainment, which uh, are two producers named Doug Davison and <coughs> Roy Lee, and they've done like, Lego Movie, The Departed, all kinds of big stuff, and they really liked it. And so with them on board, it had some clout. Um, and then uh, the Yari Film Group, who was financing it, essentially um, said, if we can get a big star to play the principal character, we think we can get this greenlit, which means we can get the money to make this movie, whether that money comes from money overseas or, or whatever. So we got the script of Bruce Willis, and he read it in London and, and signed on to play the principal of the of uh, high school, mm -hmm. uh, and once we had him, then essentially we had enough power to say, okay, let's finance this movie. When this film is going to be made, then as a writer, do you have any involvement from that point on? Usually, usually you don't. And and Tim and I, my writing partner at the time, were fortunate that we did. Um, you know, we were 26 or 27, so we were just really you know, fresh and didn't know anything. But we ended up hiring a first-time director as well. So it's kind of like the three of us in on it for the first time. And at uh, Vertigo and Yard Filmers credit, they really let us be involved. And, you know, we helped with casting. And, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, actors who've become big stars since then. Steve <coughs> Kravitz in it, yeah. and, uh, Melanie Diaz. And we recognize a lot of these faces. And, and they were all, you know, 20 years old at the time. And um, kind of became their, their first movie. And so you were going around planting Fenwick things. On the set. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, it was great. They're like, you know, they would ask us, you know, what should this look like? And yeah. I would just be like, oh, here's a picture of it. <laughs> you know, yeah. it looks like this school. And and Tim, my writing partner, uh, had gone to a uh, Catholic school in uh, Pennsylvania as well. So right. we both kind of drew from those experiences. Gotcha. I wonder if I can, with that high school, dial you back a little bit. When did you graduate here? 1997, so 20 years ago. Gotcha. What are you, well, you were in the class with women then. Yeah, so uh, we were the second co-ed class. My class was the second co-ed class. And it's funny, just creatively, <coughs> Fenwick has like been a well of inspiration for me. Like This show that I'm doing right now is also loosely based on Fenwick. Uh, and it's about that experience of being a, uh, a school that has just gone co-ed. So like, when I was a freshman, all the juniors and seniors here were all guys. So it was a very like bizarre, like, so as a freshman, Dude, like any girls are not going to talk to you. They're going to talk to the juniors and seniors, you know. So it was a very bizarre dynamic where you know you have juniors and seniors who are it's all guys. And it's sort of this boys club, and they you know they don't even care if they have stains on their shirts. They've been walking around, they haven't showered in days. Like they just don't care about anything, you know, because that's just kind of what they're used to. Uh, so it was a, it was sort of an interesting uh, experience to be a uh, freshman year at a school that was going co-ed. And even back then, I just thought it was very funny. Um, and so that turned into Play by Play, which is what I'm doing right now. It's a, a TV show on a streaming service called Go Night. Yeah, we'll look at a little bit of that in, in just a minute. What, what was high school like for you? Who, who were you in high school? Yeah, yeah. I was a little, I was a little bit Max Fisher from Rushmore. Uh -huh. Have you guys ever seen that movie? Yeah. It's one of my favorites. Just kind of involved in way too much stuff. Uh -huh. uh, I was in student council. I played hockey and soccer. Hockey was really my focus. That was uh, something I was really interested in. Um, uh, started the video yearbook year. Did you really? Which was fun. Yeah. Uh, 
But Did you write for Bono? I, that was my biggest regret. Was I, didn't, I couldn't because of hockey. Oh, okay. was, but I did, I had my own cable access TV show. Do you guys know what cable access even is? Probably not. Probably not. So they still exist, but every local community would have sort of like uh, their own TV station. Anybody who wanted to would take some classes or whatever they could put stuff on the air. You were way too old. I was, yes. Yeah. And I'm from Batavia, yes, which is right by Aurora. So right. when we had the show, my like four best friends in Batavia, where I grew up, uh, it was sort of like Saturday Night Live, like mock newscast and sketches and stuff like that. And they would call us the real way through because it was you know, right next yes. door. But that's, that was what I did creatively in high school. It was almost like two different worlds. I had Fenwick, where student council and, and sports, and then I had Batavia, where I would do this little TV show. Like, no one from Fenwick knew anything about the TV show. Yeah. Uh, but that was what I did in high school. You went out from there to Villanova. Yes. Uh, How was that? It was great. Yeah, it was, uh, I was having this, uh, I was talking to my sister who also went here last night a little bit about it, and I remember, you know, because I was always just very interested in film, like I knew I always wanted to be a screenwriter, like that was it, that was the, that was the plan, how I was going to get there was another story. When I was applying to colleges here, um, you know, I was talking to Mr. Egan, who's no longer here. Yeah, he retired, retired right? a couple years ago. Really influential, yeah. Mr. Egan and Mr. Borsch, um, you know, about where I wanted to go to college and what I wanted to do. And I was thinking about applying to you know these very artsy schools, and uh, I sat down with Mr. Borsch, and he's like, Jack Bossy, I don't see you going to an artsy school. Like that doesn't feel like you. You're going to get sort of caught up in in sort of this machine of of and being an art student. Like I can't see you wearing turtlenecks and smoking cigarettes. That just doesn't seem like you. And he kind of talked me out of going to an art school. He's like, go to a regular school, find what you you know. Tell your stories that way, or just yeah. just like, and and that's. Was it good advice? It was great advice. It was probably some of the best advice I ever got. Because at Villanova, I got to, you know, be in a fraternity and play hockey there and write for the paper and um, all those things that some of my art school contemporaries might not have been able yeah. to do. So that, as a writer, it's all about your experiences, and that gave me just those experiences. So then I would write. You know, I I wrote about what it was like to go to a school like that. And, um, what did you major? Communications and English. Did you? Yeah. I, I know it's a question for some of the guys in this class who are interested potentially in writing or video editing or acting. You know, where do I go? Yeah. What do I do? And it's a scary thought, right? It is. Because you have to explain to your parents, I'm going to make my living as a comedy writer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is, a, it is a scary thing. And I guess that was probably Mr. Borsch's other part of it, like, get a degree from a good liberal arts school, uh, and that, you know, that was probably the best school I could get into, yeah. and I got it by the skin of my teeth. I was just thinking that I took the train in here from Batavia today, and yeah. I was just replaying all these events in my mind, but I didn't even find out until the day before I graduated that no I got to <laughs> so, so And then you went to Ireland. And then I did, yeah. Then I went to graduate school, uh, University <coughs> College Dublin in Ireland. Uh, which was also another wonderful experience, and that came about because I didn't get into any film schools in the mm -hmm. United States of America. So uh, it was sort of, I don't know, I just think sort of the road less traveled always brings better stories. And this was, like, I, I was an American living in Ireland, and the first screenplay that I wrote that was any good was, a, was about being an American in Ireland. And I would have never been able to write that had I gone to NYU or Northwestern or whatever. So it was great, I lived in, in Dublin, um, for just over a year, I worked at a pub across the street from where I lived, uh, and their their master's program was only like 13 months, and it cost like a quarter of what it would cost to go to school here. It was, it was great. And I moved back home with my parents, worked at a liquor store for six months. Uh, was a substitute teacher. Were you really? Yeah, saved up enough money and then, and then moved to LA. Did you? Yeah. So you really have always tried to make a living as a writer? Yeah, so. that's, and you know, it can, you have good years and bad years, but uh, I've always just, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of is since I was at South Park as a production assistant, I've been a writer ever since. Yeah. When I left that job when I was 26, like, I've been a professional writer since then, so that's 12 years. And what's production assistant? What's that? That's just a grunt, essentially. Really? That's doing long. Well. Yeah, that's just like whatever needs to be done. So there were four of us at, at South Park Studios uh, that would just, you know, get lunch and, and run the office and answer phone calls and do research on whatever ridiculous thing they needed us to do research on. People 
people still watch South Park? Do you guys ever see South sometimes? Okay. I do want to include, by the way, I know I'm asking questions. If you have a question or a thought, please interrupt me. Yeah. That's really important. But I, I have to ask you personally, what are Trey and Matt like? They're nice guys. Yeah, they? yeah, totally. Trey, Trey is a little bit more in sort of his own world. And I don't know them very well. Yeah. I mean, I just work there. Yeah. And, um, but uh, they're good guys. Matt is a little more personable. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's funny, like, <laughs> Trey really is the the genius behind it. But mm -hmm. sort of without Matt, it wouldn't work. So it's a very interesting dynamic. But they, what I learned most from them is they just work really, really hard. Because uh, they, they do the show in like six days. It's right? crazy. Yeah. Like we would have uh, there be an idea, and again, when I was working there, I wasn't part of the writing process. I was very much just an assistant. Uh, but they would have an idea, and then something could come up in the news, and it would change like that, and you'd have to scrap everything and rewrite everything. Which they do a, an episode a week, which is amazing. And the other great thing about that is that because they are their own sort of entity, they don't have to uh, take notes from the studio, they don't have people breathing down their neck, like whatever they want to do, they do, and that's what goes on the air, and that's, that's really commendable, and really, you know, it's sort of unheard of. I know you have a lot of writing credits that come up for a while, but the next one, I think, that's your creation is legendary dude yes. Can you yes. talk about that? Sure. Uh, so I, I wrote films, to get to that point quickly, I wrote, so Assassination Happened, um, unfortunately, uh, it was when the bottom dropped out in the economy and the distribution got mixed, and so it was in bankruptcy court for like two years, so no one saw the movie. So that didn't help our career. Yeah, and I, I want yeah. you to go on, but I, get, I do have to interrupt yeah. on that. It didn't get the distribution and everything. But it's got a great cult following. Uh, a number yeah, yeah. of friends of mine who are kind of film geeks all know the oh, film. Oh, great. Oh, that's They're, great to you hear. You know, and it kind of threw Netflix or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's I'm sorry, great. No, ahead. that's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, so from that, uh, Tim and I, my writing partner at the time, got a bunch of studio work. So we would meet with like Lionsgate or Playtone, which is Tom Hanks's company, and they had a project that they thought we were good for, which is about this pool player named Kid Delicious, which was an article in Sports Illustrated. So we took that article, wrote a screenplay, didn't get made into a movie, but we got paid to write. Uh, did the same thing for Warner Brothers with Zac Efron attached to play this big sci-fi comedy called Einstein Theory. Wrote it, didn't get made. Did another one for Paramount about a local band scene and the MTV generation. Wrote it, great, didn't get made. Uh, what was it? Another one for Illumination, which was uh, uh, Illumination did like Despicable Me and stuff like that. Wrote it, great, didn't get made. So by that point, you know, just a little frustrated that, you know, I'm a career doing this, but um, you know they're just not getting made. They're sitting on a shelf somewhere. And so segued into TV. Um, did a, uh, uh, a pilot for Fox, an animated pilot. Remember the TV show Cops? Does everyone know that? So it was like yeah. the animated version of that. It was ridiculous and really funny. What a big voice, right? J.K. Simmons. J.K. Simmons was in it. Michael Rappaport, yeah. uh, Chris Klein, this guy Nat Faxon, who was awesome. Uh, so yeah, it was a great cast and really funny. Didn't get well. The pilot got made, but uh, didn't didn't make it on the air. Uh, but that got me introduced into the TV world, uh, and um, I really liked it. I think what I like most about TV is that if you do it right, you can stay with these characters much longer than you could in, in a film, which is just an hour and a half. Like a character in a TV show that lasts five or six seasons, you can write five or six years about on that character. So then got really into TV. Um, I pitched and sold some ideas to Nickelodeon. Um, bizarrely, I never thought I'd do kid stuff, but I just I had one idea called Dickie Danger in the Cafeteria Kid, which was like Butch and Sundance when set in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. It was this animated show, and that got sold. Didn't get made. <laughs> and then I uh, uh, pitched another idea to Nickelodeon called Homeroom, which was essentially the office, but for seventh grade kids mm -hmm. set in a class. And uh, you know, shot documentary style. It was about two brothers named Tyler and Sam Duda. Tyler was this uh, seventh grade idiot who had failed a grade last year, but he claimed it was so he could be the coolest kid in school because he's the oldest. He was kind of a moron. And then his brother, his younger brother, Sam, uh, was super smart. He skipped a grade. So he got a brother who, who got held back, and a brother skipped a grade, and they're now in the same class together. And that became legendary. Yeah. So it was it's a, a very funny show. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. It's tricky. Kids' TV is tricky. Like, you know, it's for children, so you can't really push the envelope too much. Uh, but uh, it was fun, and it was, a, it was a cool experience. I definitely learned a lot from it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
You created it. Uh -huh. You wrote the episodes? So, yeah, so I wrote, so I pitched the idea to Nickelodeon. Every, everything that gets made can have a different path. Mm -hmm. I, I had done the animated thing with Nickelodeon, and I pitched them this idea, they bought it, so then they paid me to write the script. You go through development with that script, they give you notes on it, you tweak things, tweak things. We made one little pilot, it was still called Homeroom, still mm -hmm. about these characters. We shot it, they loved it, they tested it with kids. Kids were like, we don't understand any of this, okay. this is stupid. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, okay. So then they went back to the drawing board, they're like, you have to change this and this and this. I said, okay, I wrote another script. They said, great, they bought it, um, greenlit it, and then, um, you know, then the way it works in television, so I've written the pilot, essentially. Yeah. And then you have a team of writers, and you write the rest of the series. In this case, you're writing as you're shooting at the same time. Right. So it's a little chaos. You were not showrunner for... I was not. There was a showrunner brought on, because I was... Maybe it's worthwhile talking sure. about what a showrunner is. So, a showrunner is... Besides yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A showrunner is usually the person who creates the show. Um, and uh, they are essentially in charge of every creative decision that is made. Uh, and also just like, they're like the, the general of the army. They're kind of running the show. Whereas in film, it's usually the director. In television, it's the creator, the writer. Um, and so that creator uh, or showrunner handles the writing room uh, where you have other writers who you break stories, which means you come up with the ideas and figure out the plot points do that collectively together, and then one or two writers will go off and actually write that episode. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's how you write uh, a series. And the showrunner is sort of in charge of that writer's room and also in charge of overseeing uh, sort of the whole operation, everything from like, I don't like how that light bulb looks, mm -hmm. to like, we need to fix this joke, to, you know, this actress is sad, we need to cheer her up, like mm -hmm. all those things. So in, uh, Legendary Duda is I was just the creator and I also ran the writer's room and we, uh, there was a producer who uh, was a development exec at Nickelodeon who came on board uh, because I was pretty fresh and knew and she knew what she was doing yeah. and uh, she served as the showrunner. But this was a unique case where almost never is the showrunner not a writer, but this mm -hmm. was one case where the showrunner was not. Mm -hmm. um, so that's is a, that a good experience? It was, it, was, it was good and it was also very, it was tough. Yeah. Um, you kind of have to I just didn't know a lot. Um, creatively, I did, but I just didn't know the nuts and bolts of how things work, how you deal with the, the network and the studio. There are just a lot of people who, if the show doesn't work, could lose their job. Yeah. So there's a lot of notes and a lot of people saying what they think the show should be and how to get there, and those, those people are not writers. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you have to figure out how to implement their notes, or, or if you don't think they work, figure out a way to, that's politically savvy to be like, these notes don't work. Um, so there's just a lot of people uh, with a lot of ideas uh, for this show, and, and that's just sort of how Nickelodeon is. Were you, were you ever a stand-up guy, or were you always No, writing? I don't have Like Mick Betancourt, he likes to do stand-up. Mick, Mick has a lot of courage. I would yeah. not be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I much prefer to, to write things and have somebody else, yeah. somebody else do it. Now, I don't know where it fits in the chronology. Somewhere in the midst of all this, you got time to write a book. That was before, well, that was around when Home Room sold, but that was sort of before Duda's aired. What got you going here? Uh, I originally wrote that as a, uh, a screenplay. Uh, that was the second screenplay I ever wrote. Um, right when I got to LA, that's what I wrote. And it got optioned, which means somebody bought the rights to it for, for a couple of years, but it, it never got made. And I just really loved the story. It was about a kid who just really wants a specific thing for Christmas. And that's it. It's a very simple story. But uh, in this case, it was Nintendo, which when I was a kid, growing up in the 80s, like that was it. That was the like, gift you could get as an eight-year-old kid. Um, so I just really loved the story. And I, you know, as a screenplay, unless it gets made, no one, you can't do anything. With it. So I thought, as a book, uh, I could hopefully get other people to enjoy the story. And, mm -hmm. and so I just wrote it as a book. That's great. Maybe it'll still be converted into a film at some point. I'd love to, yeah. So that, like Christmas Story, yes. you can then do all-day marathons on, yes. on TNT. <laughs> so great. I, I did want to ask you to read just a couple of pages. Oh, sure. uh, and I uh, reread the book this week, which was oh, just wow. great. Uh, and so I picked out. What year is it? What year is everybody in here? Are you guys all different years or juniors? Juniors, juniors, and seniors. What a cool class! I wish I had this. Couple pages. Sure. 
uh, of that, and I'm, I'm sorry ahead of time. There is an asshole in here, so cover your ears when you get to that. Uh, sure. Um, Timmy Clean may have been a spaz and an asshole, but he was no dumb. He was the only Cub Scout in the cafeteria who smiled when Hallberg pulled the sheet back on those encyclopedias. Because that meant his Nintendo would become twice as valuable. This deep into December, there was no way any of us could get our own Nintendo before Christmas now. It was an impossibility, a pipe dream, one that Clean knew he could capitalize on big time. The following Saturday morning, the line to get into Clean's house was no longer a line. It was a mob. Half the school had descended onto his front yard like a swarm of locusts, pushing and shoving and generally trading on his unpleasantries. Not only did Clean still have the only Nintendo in town, but word was that he had just gotten the power glove as an early Christmas present. This was very good news. We've been reading about the power glove in Nintendo Power Magazine months, staring at pictures, drooling over the technology. Its engineering was revolutionary. It was as though the future had decided to grace the Nintendo Corporation with a gift, a glove that you wore in your hand that allowed you to control the game with a flick of your wrist. The thing made Luke Skywalker's metal, metal hand replacement look like a tinker toy. As far as we were concerned, it was the missing link to humans finally becoming man robots. And there wasn't a boy among us who wouldn't run over his own family to become a man robot. That went without saying. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much. <coughs> Please pick it up. Uh, uh, I think uh, Mr. Kinley has it displayed up with the books by yeah. Fenwick Cup. There's some incredibly, I heard there are that. a lot of writers yeah, yeah, uh, there sure are. Uh, here and, and pick, that, pick that up. Not the business of writing, we've been talking about that, but about writing itself. What's writing like for you? Are you a methodical get up every every morning and write? I am, yeah. It's hard. Writing's just hard. Like it's like you know when you have a like a paper due the next day and you haven't started it yet? That's every day of my life. <laughs> it's hard, but I love it. Uh, I get up, you know, it de depends on the day, yeah. but if I'm just writing, I'll get up early and I write better in the morning. So I just shower and then I'm at my desk mm -hmm. writing, write a couple hours, a cup of tea, write a couple more hours, have lunch. And then usually by the afternoon, I, I still try to keep writing, but I'm pretty worthless. Mm -hmm. Like there's nothing good that happens in the afternoon. Uh, but I, I, I'm better in the, in the morning. That's kind of my process. Yeah. What's your process, John? You know, I'm early morning. I get up, I uh, said so I was up this morning, I get up about 4 <coughs> every wow, morning. Wow. And so I'm writing by 4.30. Uh, and I do less. I don't depend on it segment for a living. So like this morning, I did an hour. And I wow. usually can get an hour every morning. Now, when something's due, then all of a yeah. sudden it's whatever hours it possibly takes. Uh, for me, without flavoring too much, I always think of it like going to the gym. Yeah, I can't take a day off. Uh, muscles yeah. start to atrophy, and I can never start telling myself, "Well, you don't have a good idea. You don't have this. You're not working on anything." Do if I do, you know, everything yeah. stops. Because you, you just, you have to be willing to write total crap. Yeah. If you're not willing to write total crap, you're not going to write at all. Because most of what you write is that. Yeah, that's always been my biggest problem, too. Yeah. It's just like not just pushing through and, and just always like, ah, I don't, you know, just, and just fine tuning stuff when you yeah. just really just need to blow through it and it's garbage and then you go back. Yeah, and I did include real quickly this is a woman who did a lot of te television work. She's a novelist now for some, some of the same reasons. She wrote so many things that didn't get made. She said, the heck with it, I'm going to make it books. She's had two books on New York Best Time Seller, and, uh, and her third big book is coming out this spring. And I mentioned her, Christina Lynch, for this, this reason. Christina estimates that she writes four to five books for every one book wow. that is, is wow. worth anything. But she's a writing machine. She yeah. just pours things up. Yeah. You think you have another book? I don't know. I would love to. I think, to me, it's almost just tricking myself yeah. into doing it. And to do that, it has to be about something I just really like mm -hmm. or really fascinated by. So I loved 80s kid pop culture. I yeah. loved Nintendo and loved Christmas so much yeah. that I was like, I could be happy writing about it every day. Um, so maybe I'll yeah. something else that I'd like to Let's Let's move from there to a really cool project. Talk about play-by-play. -play. Sure. Play-by-play uh, -play is, is the thing I'm, I'm most proud of of anything I've done so far in my career. Uh, it's a show about an ESPN sportscaster who looks back on his life in the 90s and sort of gives the play-by-play -play of his adolescence. So it's about this kid named Pete Hickey who comes from this, that's set in Oak Park, 
uh, who comes from this family of jocks, essentially. His little sister is like this amazing athlete. His little brother is this amazing athlete. His mom and dad are these great athletes. And Pete really hasn't, he's not. And he hasn't really figured that out yet. And so it's about just him going through his four years in high school um, uh, and, and finding his voice and ultimately finding his voice as a sportscaster. So it's, you guys ever seen The Wonder Years? I know that's not your time frame, but uh, it's one of my no, favorite Gene and I are not. Great show. Yeah. 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 So it's like that, but set in the 90s and sort of seen through the lens of sports and seen through the lens of what it's like to grow up in the Midwest, what it's like to go to a Catholic high school. And, uh, is really into sports. Yeah. Um, so there's, a, again, a lot of Fenwick there. Let me give him a little taste of it, then we'll talk about it. So uh, this is another thing that uh, I wrote on spec, which means nobody paid me to do it. I, I wrote the, uh, the pilot, uh, and then bizarrely, very quickly, uh, uh, a company called Complex Networks, which is owned by Verizon, <coughs> loved it, and uh, they bought it, and they ordered eight episodes of the series. Uh, they let me show run it. So I'm like, this is great. Yeah. So uh, we shot the first eight episodes in Iowa, actually, uh, in Des Moines, to match Oak Park, Illinois, just because it was a little cheaper to shoot in Iowa. Um, and uh, we got picked up for uh, seasons two and three, so I just finished shooting them uh, in Iowa. And in post production right now, which is editing and music and doing all that with those two seasons. And uh, season two should come out, I think, in June. And so what's this running? It's on a, uh, has anyone heard of Go90? Has anyone ever heard of that? A couple people? No? Okay, I've never heard of it either. Uh, it's, a, it's Verizon's new streaming service. Yeah. It's just like Netflix, except it's free, which is pretty cool. Uh, every once in a while there might be a commercial in it, but if you go to Go90 and look up play-by-play, uh, -play, uh, I think you guys will dig it. It's, uh, it's, it's on there right now and it's free. You can watch yeah. the whole first season. Yeah, I did get to see the first season. Uh, there, I'd seen one episode when I knew you were coming. I got to see it. the the show. You're gonna love the show. It is very hysterical. It's also very warm. I think. Thank you. Uh, it, yeah. It's a funny show, but it's got a lot of a lot of heart. That's what you wanted. Yeah. yeah I think basically anything I write is. You, anyone ever asks me, you know, what's your style or whatever? Yeah. It's humor with heart. That's that's what I enjoy. I think that's yeah. closest to my personality. Um, and so that is what this, this show is. Are you enjoying being showrunner? It's great. Well, yeah, yeah, it's great, man. Uh, and because this is pretty low budget and it's from a, a studio that's relatively new, I don't. There's not a lot of people. Um, you know, there's not a lot of cooks in the kitchen. It's, it's just me, um, uh, my writing staff. When we, you know, wrote all the episodes, and then when I'm in Iowa, it's me and yeah. other producers and. Everybody has their role. It's funny you say it's so fun. It's, it's kind of great look. Thanks. I mean, really. We got some really great directors. Um, yeah. First season uh, and uh, directors the second and third season as well. Great cinematographers. Yeah. Um, and that shows. They did really a good. they did a really great. That has nothing to do with me. So. No. Yeah. 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 But it's been the great. They, they did a great but job. Let me extend to uh, to the group uh, on this. Do you have questions or comments you'd like to ask? It's really. Yeah. Love this for me. <laughs> and see, when we're really thinking, like three of us are going, what might that be? That's okay, but feel free to, <laughs> to extend there. You're not far enough in your life to really look back, but with a little bit of looking back, you talked about thinking as you came in on, on the train. You ought to peddle some advice to high school students. Sure. Uh -huh. Well, let's see. Uh, first of all, uh, you'll find this as you get older, like, it's just great to be a Fenwick Friar. It really is. There's this whole community that just, they take care of one another, and, and they love you, you know? And, like, even being in California, like, there's a community of Friars out there. Like, some of my friends have helped. Mick Bedford, who just gave, mm -hmm. like, I didn't know Mick. Mick was five years older than me. Yeah. But I was out there, and there was a Fenwick reunion or something, and mm -hmm. I got introduced to him, and, you know, he's a writer, and, and you know, we're buddies now. And that's somebody that the only connection in the world is Fenwick. Amy Garcia is a uh, an actress out there, yeah. so I know her from Fenwick. I didn't know her in high school, but there's just a there's a community anywhere you go, wherever you live. There's a Fenwick community, and uh, it's a it's a pretty special place. And, and I think as I got older, I, I realized that more. Um, I don't know if that's advice. It's just no. more appreciation than anything else. Yeah, right here. We used to have a, a marketing slogan. I used to work in kind of communications here. Uh, that said, 
high school last four years, Fenwick lasts a lifetime. Yeah. And I, I think That's there's cool. there's some uh, some truth to that. What's in the pipeline for you? What's coming up? Well, just trying to uh, finish these two seasons, uh, which since we shot them back to back is a lot. Yeah. It's a lot to just kind of manage and figure out. And you're shooting is that unusual to shoot two seasons? It is a little unusual, yeah. I think, I think we did it just because there was momentum and uh, when you're shooting with younger kids, which a lot of this is, yeah. if you wait seven or eight months to shoot again, they're, they're going to look old. different. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you kind of have to uh, you know, shoot as quickly as possible. Other than that, you know, I, I hope we get two more seasons for play by play. Yeah. I'm always working on, on new things. I, I'd like to uh, get back into, uh, I'd like to write another feature because I've been doing TV for a while. So I, I'm, I'm starting the process of trying to trying to write that next one. Yeah. Uh, Do you? We talked about uh, Go 90. Some of those. So much is changing in television right now. You have any thoughts about that? With, you know, yeah. streaming episodes, dumping a whole season at once, binging, have you thought about that? That's a good question, yeah. I mean, I, I think for me it's great because there are so many more outlets uh, to get, you know, to, to work, to make mm -hmm. a living and to create things that you're passionate about because, uh, you know, 20 years ago when I was in high school, um, you know, they were... Put it on a network. That was it, really. There were only a few channels and now there's so much content out there. I, I think the bubble's going to burst pretty soon here. Uh, and I think Go90 is an example of that, whether this network exists two years from now, yeah. uh, I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's the golden age of television yeah. right now. Guy told me early, when I first got out of college, I initially worked as an actor. Guy told me at that time, <laughs> talking about acting, he said, John, act for anybody that will let you <laughs> yeah. any time. Would you say that about like TV? And yeah. Film? If yeah. they'll let you write something? Totally. Do totally. It. I mean, you get to a point where, you know, it's a big it's a big risk doing anything artistic. I yeah. mean, you just have to give up a lot and, and you have to be okay with not making any money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes, like, I remember my first staff writing job uh, was School of Rock, which was on the yeah. Paramount lot. And, right. you know, it was, a, it, it was a movie I had loved. And, uh, but I was just so excited to have an office to go to every yeah. day, you know? That's as a writer. As a writer, Well, yeah. and, and there's a particular kick. I would tell you, the first time I got a check for a book, the, yeah. I was full-time employed as a teacher and everything else. But from there on in, when people said, what do you do? I said, I'm a writer. Nice, yeah. And I could prove it. I got yeah. a check. I'm not yeah. Gonna, yeah. You can put that yeah. thing in. Yeah. I did want to check. Did you have family? Or? Uh, yeah, I'm married. We have a kid on the way. Do you really? So Congratulations. February, very excited. Soon? Or? Yeah, February. 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 That's wonderful. It's coming up, so I got a lot to take care of before then. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's really exciting. Yeah. Kevin, I, it's such a thrill for us uh, to have you back. back Thanks here. so much I for I appreciate having the trip. Uh, coming in, and, and I know the class does does as well. All the best on all your work. Thanks so much. Good and time. notice that I came in right on time. <laughs> That's good. Amazing. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.